Good morning. I'm Linda Callahan, and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of this Unitarian Universalist Society. I use she, her pronouns. Welcome to you, old friends and new, young and old, in the Zoom and in the sanctuary. You are an essential part of our celebration today. Whether today is your first or your thousandth Sunday in our midst, we are stronger because you are with us. We are one people of many beliefs, many origins, sexualities, and genders. We are all growing, all learning, all loved. Just as you are, you are welcome here. As part of our effort to seek feedback on the governance of our congregation, you are invited to join us during the first 15 minutes of any regular meeting of the board, or by chatting with us during the social hour, or by using the email address board at uusocietyamherst.org. We are grateful to be in community with you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Yael Fierce. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm today's worship associate. Today we welcome back Sister Alex Capitan uh, to build on the conversations we started in June about radical welcome. Our opening words come from Tanya Marquez. It is a wonder and mystery that our paths have crossed, that in the immensity of time, in the vastness of space, we coincide here. I am in awe at the ways in which our lives intersect and intertwine, at the beauty we create when we gather. May our coming together make us more compassionate, more just, more caring, and more loving. May our hearts and minds be open to this offering. I am so glad you are here. Let us worship. Let us marvel at the miracle of being here right now and the mystery that has brought us together. Good morning. Good morning. Our chalice lighting words, I think you have them. Do you have them? I have them too. No, I've got them. I do, I promise. We light this flame to invite a world of peace where we heal the wounds, where we share what we have with one another, where justice is another word for relationship, and we listen for what love has to say. That's lovely. So nice to be with you all this morning. Let's sing together. Our opening hymn is number 389 in the gray hymnal, Gathered Here. songs. Thank you all. So, hi. hi. My name is Alex, Zister Alex Capitan, and I was here in June. Who remembers that? Yay! If you weren't there, that's okay. I'm excited to be back with you. 
Uh, my pronouns are Z and per, which is short for person. And um, I travel around visiting congregations. And you'll hear more from me in a little bit. But at first, I have a story for you. How do you feel about that? It's a really great story. If you want to come closer so you can see the pictures, you're very welcome to do that now. I'm going to sit up here. I think I'm going to move this so more people can see. So anyone who wants to see the pictures is welcome to come up here. I don't care how old you are or how big or small you are, because I like seeing the pictures. All right. Can the people online see too? Where should I show it? Should I be like this? OK. I'll do my best. This book is called In the Neighborhood, and it was written and illustrated by Rocio Bonilla. And here is how it goes. <laughs> I love the pictures, even this one. There's no words with this one. There's a robot and a little chick and a box of noodles. OK, let's get into it. Once. Upon a time, there was a neighborhood. Like so many others, it had houses, streetlights, trees, and neighbors who had never met one another. Camilla lived at number 15. There was always a lot of noise coming out of her house. The neighbors figured she was hard of hearing, so she had to turn up the volume on her TV. Reasonable assumption. <gasps> but the reason for all that noise was actually that Camilla had 10 babies who were 10 bundles of energy. Camilla looks very tired. She's pouring coffee and it is overflowing the cup. While the babies are everywhere, including hanging off the light fixtures. Camilla didn't dare to start up a conversation with her neighbor, Mr. Martinez. He seemed so serious and so straight laced. She was convinced he didn't like kids and wouldn't want to have anything to do with her. Mr. Martinez worked in the city. He was an important lawyer, just like his mother, grandfather, and great-grandfather before him. You can see pictures of his ancestors, who were also very serious lawyers. He looks very serious, having a serious conversation on the phone. But when Mr. Martinez got home from work, he changed completely. He had a secret hobby, juggling. He dressed up like a clown. If only I had an audience, he sighed. His neighbors were a noisy hen and a huge dragon who didn't seem to have much of a sense of humor. Silhouette of a dragon next door. The truth was there was no huge dragon living on the street. Mr. Martinez's neighbor was a little mouse who lived in fear because a cat had moved in nearby. We all know what cats like to eat, right? Philip the mouse was very creative, and he came up with a clever solution to keep his very dangerous feline neighbor from coming anywhere near him. You see what he did? What did he do? He made a, cardboard dragon or something. <laughs> he made a dragon costume out of cardboard. Yes, so no one knows. But what Philip couldn't possibly imagine was that the cat across the street was vegan. <laughs> he never ate mice. Rodolfo the cat loved to play cards, knit pillows, and most of all, lovingly tend his vegetable garden. Rodolfo was so shy that he'd never even once waved to his neighbor. Would you risk annoying a fierce dragon? No. Look at that amazing vegetable garden. He's so proud. So proud, as he should be. I can't grow tomatoes like that. On the corner lived Matilda, a brilliant scientist. She worked all day in her garage, building astonishing inventions. Matilda only spoke to her robots because she had no one else to talk to. She figured no one lived next door. That house was always locked up tight. Wow, look at all those robots. Amazing. But. Someone did live there. It was just that Mrs. Paquita slept all day, like owls do. Then she spent all night on the internet, reading the news and playing game after game of solitaire. So this is what her house looked like. No one thought she lived there because she was awake at night. It didn't matter that her blinds were closed. 
She didn't even remember to raise her blinds. Too obsessed with the internet. Pepe, the ogre, lived at the top of a beanstalk. No one ever rang his bell, so he never left the house. He was convinced his neighbors were afraid of him because ogres have such a bad reputation. See his doorbell? Yeah. It's just waiting for someone to push it. The truth was, Pepe was a bookworm who yearned to share his love of reading. He dreamed about organizing a book club in the neighborhood, or even better, two. One for books about traveling, and another for superhero books, which were his very favorite kind. Can you tell? Yeah. He's wearing a superhero outfit, reading a book. Then one fine day, something terrible happened. Mrs. Paquita's internet connection stopped working. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, this is horrible, she moaned. Matilda was shocked to hear her neighbor. Someone did live next door. Since Matilda was very handy, since she's a brilliant scientist, she was able to solve Mrs. Paquita's problem in the blink of an eye. She fixed her internet. Such a great neighbor. What? What? The next day, Mrs. Paquita realized that she needed one more egg for her cake recipe. She rang her neighbor's doorbell for the first time ever. Pepe the ogre was very pleased to see she wasn't afraid of him, and he ran down to have tea and cake. Probably climbed down, right? Yeah. Right. Look at that tiny little egg. He's like, I can lend you an egg. So excited. Camilla looked out her window and was surprised to see three neighbors eating cake together. That made her think she should try knocking on Mr. Martinez's door. She found out that he wasn't so straight-laced after all. He's wearing his clown outfit. Rodolfo the cat got a big surprise when he decided to put aside his fear and shyness to go visit his dragon neighbor for the very first time. He's bringing over a basket of vegetables and discovers a mouse in a dragon outfit. Soon everyone knew one another. They became friends. The neighborhood was now something different, a community. They're all having an amazing picnic together. Carrots on sticks, yes, they are grilling vegetables <laughs> grown by Rodolfo the cat. And everybody was happier. You've got the ogre and the chicken reading books together. You've got the clown putting on a show for the babies. There looks like a very serious card game happening between the owl and the cat. And then somebody started a new blog, the vegan cat. The end. Yay! So one of the things we're going to be talking about up here today is how hard it can be to actually get to know people, particularly when they're different from you. And I don't know if you all know this, this is kind of a secret, but adults are worse at this. <laughs> they're, they're worse, right? Like it's, it's, it's harder somehow for adults to like actually try to make friends when their people are different from each other. So this happens a lot, right? In neighborhoods, it can happen in churches like this where we think we know something about each other, but it turns out we don't actually know each other that well until we get into a relationship. So this is a big part of being a Unitarian Universalist to me, is to make friends and get to know each other uh, regardless of what we might think of each other. And at the end of the day, it's so much more fun. We get to have amazing picnics with carrots on sticks. <laughs> so, I hope you all have a great time today while you are doing whatever Andrew's about to tell us about.
Did you like my story? Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? And you thought, you thought I was kidding about the whole, it's hard to do that, right? No, you knew. <laughs> it is. It is. So it is so good to be back with you all today. Like I said before, I was here in June. I had such a lovely time getting to know some of you. Um, and I talked about radical welcome. That was, that's a topic I talk about quite a bit and how essential and needed it is for congregations like this one to understand welcome as a spiritual practice, right? A practice of striving to draw the circle ever wider, wider and wider. A practice of ensuring that your welcome of people who are already here and of people who want to be here isn't conditional right? That it's an unconditional welcome so that everyone can bring all of who we are forward and be celebrated for doing so. So if you weren't here, that's what I talked about. That's the nutshell. Am I right? Did I miss anything important? <laughs> People are like, whoa, I wasn't expecting you to have a quiz. It's fine. So the hardest thing about this concept of welcome is shifting it from the theoretical to the real, of course, right? That's the hard part. So I'm back today to talk more about what it takes to fully understand and build your muscles around this practice of radical welcome. How's that sound? Sounds, Sounds pretty good. So that we can be like the animals in today's picture book and actually build those relationships across lines of difference and form a real community rather than just a collection of folks who are dealing with our projections of each other, right? Um, one of the things I mentioned last time I was here is that um, I've been a Unitarian Universalist ever since my parents joined a UU church outside Milwaukee when I was six years old. Um, and I wanna tell you a little bit more about my parents. They're great, I love them. I think of them as the quintessential Unitarian Universalists. They come from previous spiritual paths that didn't fit them. They are white and middle class and in their early 70s, and they both have higher degrees. They are teachers and artists. My dad was an environmentalist way before it was cool. Yup. They listen to NPR and read the New York Times and own two cars and a house in a suburb. They're politically active and vote Democrat. Sound familiar? <laughs> yeah. I think of my home congregation as the quintessential UU congregation as well, um, outside Milwaukee. It's full of wonderful, kind people, most of whom are also white and middle class and higher educated and politically liberal. Church members do a volunteer shift at a soup kitchen downtown once a month and always turn out for the neighborhood river cleanup. They are very proud of the rainbow icon on their road sign and the solar panels on their roof, which is... <laughs> Legit, it was, it was actually, you know, difficult in the suburb that they're in and ruffled some feathers to do both of those things. Um, I'm so grateful that my parents joined my home church. It was a truly wonderful place to grow up and it gave me so many gifts, so much freedom to explore what I believed about the world, about myself, about that which is greater than ourselves. It gave me an incredible strong foundation in the conviction that our purpose is to leave the world better than we found it and to work toward liberation from oppression. All of this is a gift beyond anything I can even begin to measure. And yet, like I shared with those of you who were here in June, the last time I was here, allowing me to exist and not actively making it harder for me to be myself in the world as a young queer and trans person was not enough for me to feel a sense of unconditional welcome and belonging as I grew up in my church into adulthood. Nor have I ever felt that way in any of the dozens of UU churches I've been to since, and I've been to a lot. I've never felt like any of them were places where I could fully get my spiritual needs met. And this is particularly hard because I was raised here, right? This is my religion. You would think that those of us who were raised UU would be the ones who would feel most at home in our congregations, right? The truth is really hard to face. The vast majority of those of us who are raised in a UU church leave. You see, my parents' church is not my church. 
I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that, but before I do, I wanna tell you a little more about my, my parents. Like I said, I love them dearly. They aren't perfect. I don't have the expectation that they would be, but I've never questioned their love for me. And they've given me so much. They gave me a great childhood, a college education, and acceptance that has grown into appreciation for who I am, even though I am not the person they expected when they were raising me. <laughs> when I was growing up, my parents' world was a reflection of themselves. Their friends were all people like them, people their age, their race, their class. Our church was a reflection of my parents' world as well. As the quintessential you use, they fit right in. It was so easy for them to feel a sense of total belonging, almost like our church had been made precisely with them in mind. As my sister and I grew older, it became clear that our parents had, you know, some expectations around how our lives would look. They expected our lives to look like theirs without being aware of it. They had so many unconscious assumptions that we would get master's degrees, own houses, be upwardly mobile, that we would have friends and partners of particular races, classes, abilities, genders. Of course they had these assumptions. They wanted the best for us based on what their own lives and cultural contexts had told them the best is, right? But my life and my sister's life don't look anything like our parents' lives. Our people are not their people. My sister married a wonderful man from Nicaragua who immigrated to Milwaukee to be with her. Spanish is the primary language spoken in their home. Theirs is a multiracial, multilingual community of friends and a huge, vibrant, extended Nicaraguan family. My community is also a multiracial, multilingual one, a community of queer and trans people of many faiths, many ages, many abilities and disabilities. Like my brother-in-law, my partner is also working class. He's a generation older than me and queer and trans and in recovery and a long-term survivor of AIDS. Our given and chosen family bridges almost every facet of difference that I can imagine. So it's hard for any parent to let go of that framed picture that grows in their mind's eye of what their child's life will be like. It was particularly hard for my parents to grasp that their experience of the world does not translate to the lives of their children. That in order to be in real relationship with us, they had to let go of all the things life had taught them about who and what is most valuable, what success looks like, what the best for their children is, and get curious about what our worlds are like, what our needs are, what brings us life. At a certain point, I had to say to them, look, I want a real relationship with you, and I know you want a real relationship with me, and in order for that to happen, I need you to stop making assumptions and start asking questions. I need you to be curious about my life and how it's different from yours, and what a difference those differences make. I need you to respect my truths. If you can't do this, we can still talk and see each other, but we're going to be people who talk about the weather. Right? Because we are so different, real relationship takes more than just being friendly to each other. It takes actively engaging with our differences and doing the hard work of unlearning our assumptions. And it is hard work. Now, my parents didn't have great relationships with their own parents. So they didn't have good models for what it would be like to have good relationships with their adult children themselves. I think Unitarian Universalism is the same way. If the quintessential you, you, like my parents, came here from somewhere else, they might not have good models for how to be a religion whose children don't leave. Did you catch that? If most UUs have fled ch churches they don't fit into, they might not know how to create a religious community where people who are different from them don't leave. It's not that our churches aren't welcoming. Of course they are. But a warm smile and not being told I'm going to hell isn't enough. <laughs> okay? If it is enough for you, no shade. 
That's great, but it's not enough for most of us. It takes a little bit more than that for me to want to come back for my spiritual needs to get met. I need more than friendliness. I need radical welcome. So I've talked about radical welcome here before, but this time I want to share with you a really powerful model that helps frame what this means to me and to, uh, I think, hopefully all of us. This model comes from Reverend Canon Stephanie Spellers, who is a leader in the Episcopal Church. And she talks about three ways that welcome shows up in congregations that are actively seeking to be welcoming. Because not all congregations are, okay? Some congregations don't want to be welcoming. But I have an expectation that we do. Um, so there's three ways that welcome shows up. Invitation, inclusion, and radical welcome. So invitation, that first type of welcome, is represented by the open door. Everyone's welcome, come on in, right? But there's usually an invisible asterisk after that phrase. All are welcome if you leave your sins, like your sexuality, at the door, right? All are welcome if you don't need a wheelchair ramp or closed captions or a fragrance-free environment. All are welcome if you are able to make a financial pledge, right? We've probably all experienced some sort of community like this at some point in our lives. Invitation says, we are a like-minded community. If you're like us, join us. The effort is friendliness and inviting newcomers into existing structures. The expectation is that everyone who comes in will be like us and be real comfy with how things are done here. The inviting congregation wants to grow, but only with people who are like us. So it's largely homogenous because people who can't fit in with those expectations eventually leave. Make sense? Right. So that's the first type. The second type of welcome is inclusion, which is re represented by the desire for diversity and surface level attempts to acknowledge people who are different from the norm here. So we might march in pride, for example, but we don't have gender neutral bathrooms. We might put up a Black Lives Matter banner, but on Sundays only use music and readings by white people. We might fill our website with images of children, but with, when parents with young kids attend, they get disapproving looks when their kids make noise during service. The inclusive congregation says, we make space for people who aren't like us. Inclusion means a congregation wants to be a place where different sorts of people feel at home, but it puts the burden on them to find a way to fit in with the way things are here. It isn't completely homogenous, but it doesn't acknowledge what a difference our differences make. So people on the margin struggle to experience full belonging and often don't last long. There's a clear us and them. Does that make sense? Okay. So radical welcome, that third type of welcome, is the practice of being transformed by relationships across lines of difference. Every time a new person visits or a new child is born into this church, those new people change our definition of us. We are a different composition of people now because someone new is here. We constantly practice curiosity about the different perspectives and needs within and outside our congregation and how they can influence the very core of who we are. The radically welcoming congregation says, we are people of all experiences, identities, and backgrounds. All of who you are belongs here. We value truly mutual relationship. The goal is to be transformed constantly through our encounters with each other. Everyone contributes to the way things are here, the how we do things here. The radically welcoming community is truly diverse. There is only us. There's no longer any them. If you're here, you're one of us. How does that sound? That sounds kind of nice. So I have a little shorty, shorty uh, 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 elevator speech that breaks this down that in, in a way I think is helpful. So like invitation is a Facebook post that says I'm having a dinner party. Everyone's welcome. Okay. Inclusion is an email that says, you are invited to my dinner party. I'm making lots of pasta. I hope you come. Radical welcome is a phone call or a text that says, hey, I, I'm thinking of having a dinner party. Where, when are you free? 
What do you like to eat? Are you vegetarian or <laughs> vegan like the cat or gluten intolerant? Do you use chopsticks? Where should we gather? Do you feel the difference? The difference is relationship, right? Now the temptation is to see this model as three stages. And I'm not gonna lie, I actually interpreted it that way when I first encountered it. But that's not actually how it works. You see, inviting congregations think welcome equals friendliness. So as long as they perceive themselves as friendly, if folks don't feel welcome, they must not belong here. Because we're being welcoming, we're friendly. Inclusive congregations think welcome equals surface level efforts to acknowledge difference. So as long as there's a rainbow flag or a ramp or a once a year gospel service, if folks don't feel welcome, that's their fault because we are already doing it, right? They should be grateful. So invitation and inclusion are actually barriers to radical welcome. So the radically welcoming congregation, welcome means transformation. It means constantly seeking to expand our definition of us and removing the barriers that some of us face. The only time I've felt radical welcome, unconditional affirmation, and deep spiritual connection in UU spaces was when I was a teenager. Now, things were hard when I was a teen. I didn't have language yet to describe who I was to myself or anyone else. I struggled with depression and anxiety. UU Youth Space was my saving grace. In those spaces, I truly felt the saving power of this faith. As teens, when we worshipped, we co-created it. We worshipped in the round, and oral tradition songs were the bedrock. We got close, or held hands. We sang rounds, and we made up harmonies, and no one ever knew when the song would end. It just ended when it was done. It was so embodied. It wasn't about thinking. It was about feeling, and being together. Can you imagine what it was like for me to supposedly grow up and be expected to worship with the adults, with their rows of chairs and their hierarchical leadership and their orders of service and classical music? It didn't work. Invitation says, come worship with us, the adults, exactly the way we do. Inclusion says, once a year, we invite the youth to lead a service, and we allow them to put the chairs in a circle. <laughs> Radical Welcome says, what would it mean if both cultures, youth culture and adult culture, informed how we worshipped? What would change? What experiences would we all have? I need Radical Welcome because my Unitarian Universalism isn't the same as my parents' Unitarian Universalism. You see, being queer and trans and raised UU means my cultural context is different from the culture of the average UU church. My flavor of Unitarian Universalism is different than the central flavor of the average UU church. My identities affect everything for me. My understanding of family, my relationship to social justice, the ways I build community, my spiritual practices, my spiritual needs, my spiritual gifts. I can't truly feel at home without having these truths affirmed. And my friends, I am haunted. I am kept awake at night by the question, who would we be? What would Unitarian Universalism look like today? And how would it be practiced differently? if all of the thousands and thousands of young people, queer and trans people, people of color, poor and working class people, disabled people, immigrants, indigenous people, neurodivergent people who have been drawn to this religion or raised here had stayed. Instead of the vast majority of all of us leaving, disappointed and disheartened because there was no room for our flavors of Unitarian Universalism. No room for us to inform how this faith is practiced, who this faith is. What I need you to understand is that drawing a circle that is wide enough for my parents' UUism and my UUism is possible. I need you to understand that this isn't about hating on NPR or classical music, I promise. It's about adding new radio bands and new rhythms. It's about creating a mosaic 
You know how a mosaic is made, right? From broken pieces. The invitation isn't to throw away my parents' UUism. The invitation is to transform it, to be made new by encounters with different flavors of Unitarian Universalism. So you want to know the good news? The good news is you already know how to do this. Because here you are doing multi-platform worship. In the before times, would you have willingly traded all the in-person goings on of this congregation to do things online instead? All of a sudden, it became painfully clear that change was necessary. If you had kept meeting in person, lives would have been at risk. And now that some people can be in person again, you didn't go back to how things were. You expanded your definition of us and weren't willing to leave some of us behind. So you've kept doing multi-platform worship. You've transformed. This is a big deal, all right? There's nothing wrong with being drawn toward what is most comfortable, especially right now. But I need you to know that not only do I need transformation, you need transformation. I couldn't believe more strongly that the point of being here, the purpose of being part of a faith community is to be changed. Not to be comfy or to rest assured that we are the good ones, but to figure out how to be in relationship how to be in community, how to be in covenant across lines of deep difference. We deeply need spaces like this one to be places where we can unlearn the judgments and assumptions and biases that have soaked into us from the outside world and practice healing the divisions that are tearing our communities and our world and our very souls apart. Because that's the only way we will survive as individuals, as a community, as a species. So if you're interested in building your muscles in radical welcome and in practicing all of this, which I hope you will be, I deeply hope you will take advantage of the opportunity to join the group of UUSA folks engaging in the program that my bestie and I created, which was on the screen earlier. It's called Trans Inclusion in Congregations. It's about so much more than transness. Um, the model that I shared with you today from Stephanie Spellers comes from that program. So it's about all the ways in which we can practice radical welcome together. It's a chance to explore the way things are here that I keep saying and how they are designed to make some folks feel real comfy and other folks feel pushed out. That's what this program is really about and how we can change that. So folks are going to be meeting three times starting on November 16th. And the deadline is in three days. It's on Wednesday. So talk to Robin if you're interested in joining the group of people who are going to be going through that program. I really hope you will. Some of you might be wondering what happened with my parents. Some of you are like, oh, I forgot about the parents. Yes, now I want to know. So the good news is my parents and I really have embraced the challenge of being in real relationship. It has not been easy. It has not been comfortable. We've had to get really real and really vulnerable with each other and understand each other's struggles, but it is worth it. And we are being changed. You see, when you're in relationship across lines of difference, it expands your world. This is what radical welcome requires of us. It requires us to change and be changed in the process. It requires us not to tolerate or accept people who are different from us, but to celebrate and love people who are different from us and allow this love to transform us. It requires us to take a leap of faith and risk letting go of things we thought we knew or things that feel comfortable and familiar in order to become something so much more. My friends, radical welcome is a tall order. It's not easy. It's not comfortable. And in order to heal our world and ourselves, it's necessary. I firmly believe this is the place where we can practice this. This is the place where we can grow, open our hearts, and be changed. Like I told you last time, I don't say yes to everybody who invites me to come preach, y'all. <laughs> You're already doing this. I know what you have to succeed. You already have it. So please know that. I hope I can count on you to join me 
in continuing this spiritual practice of radical welcome because it is truly one of the most holy, heart-transforming, and world-changing things that we can do together. Amen. Ashe, aho, and blessed be. possible times. So much feels so big and so beyond our control and so many folks today have speak, spoken to cancer, illness, deep struggles in relationship. I want to invite us now to simply breathe, to hold the truth that we are not alone. That's why we're here. In this gathered community, we can be held. We can hold each other. So let's breathe in that truth. Breathe in. Breathe out. Again, breathe in. Breathe out. Keep breathing. Allow yourself to open your heart to what you are holding right now. There may be anxiety, there may be fear, there may be grief, there may be numbness, there may be hope, there may be joy, there may be yearning. As you breathe in, just sit with it and send yourself love. Breathe in. Breathe out. What are you holding? Send it love. 
Now allow yourself to feel the energy of the other people present here, whether you are in person or you're joining us online. Send love to all the other folks here, everyone who shared, everyone who didn't. Imagine that love flowing out from you and touching all the other folks here. As you breathe in, breathe in the love that is flowing toward you. As you breathe out, send love out. Breathe in love. Breathe out love. Keep breathing. Keep breathing in the love that is flowing to you and breathing out to others with love in this gathered community. Let's just take three more deep breaths in and out. And now if it feels good, let's sing. You can stay seated for this one. I think that would be awesome. You don't have to sing. You can hum. You can just keep breathing. The song is Love Will Guide Us, number 131 in the Gray Hymnal. up there so I know I'm right. I lost the words. There they are. Yay. Okay. We're going to say them together. Ready? We extinguish this flame but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Lovely. 
Our closing words come from EU Minister Reverend Joe Cherry, and they're called Prayer for Living in Tension. If we have any hope of transforming the world and changing ourselves, we must be bold enough to step into our discomfort, brave enough to be clumsy there, loving enough to forgive ourselves and others. May we, as a people of faith, be granted the strength to be so bold, so brave, and so loving. Go in peace.